this is just the beginning. I'm Ina Fried with Axios. Welcome. I'd like to welcome all those joining us via Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn, and via the Axios website. I'm coming to you from my home in San Francisco. Welcome to the 5G revolution. Thanks to our partner Qualcomm for making this possible. Uh, please follow along with the hashtag Axios events and at Axios on Twitter. And for the latest news, you can always go to Axios.com. For our first segment, I'd like to welcome uh, the representative of New York 6th Congressional District, Representative Grace Meng. Hi, you know, good to be with all Hi. of you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for taking the time. Obviously, so timely that we're having this conversation. In terms of the backdrop here, I mean, you had been working on what's been called the homework gap for a long time. Basically, the fact that doing your work at home no longer just required a paper and pen, but really required digital access. And even before the pandemic, I think it was as many as 12 million Americans didn't have access to the technology they needed. Correct. Actually, 12 million students um, were in households without adequate internet access. And in my few years in Congress, I've traveled a little bit to various districts around the country and really had met one too many kids uh, who weren't able to do their homework at home. Um, much of the assignments, unlike when I was a kid, uh, much of them are given online or, or completed online these days. And so it's really hard uh, for these students that I met who weren't able to do their homework at home. For sure. I remember doing term papers on a typewriter, and I, I don't believe anyone's doing that mm -hmm. anymore except to be retro hip. Obviously, the pandemic, though, has taken what was already a serious problem with the homework gap and really made it a school gap. At this point, for many children around America, if they don't have access to a fast broadband connection and a device, and one for each kid, not one for each family, it's not just homework right. they're missing out. They risk missing out on school. Definitely. Like you said, I had been working on this issue for months and years before. And then when the pandemic hit, and there were approximately uh, 55 million students that were at home, not able to physically go to school, and many were not able to do their homework. So what was originally a problem, um, not for everyone around the country, uh, suddenly became a dire and very time sensitive issue uh, because these kids weren't able to go to school and participate and learn. And I've seen that in my own life. We, Our son is in first grade or was in first grade last year, attends the public schools. And I've noticed like a couple of his kids just dropped off the map because they either didn't have a device or whatever, and we didn't see them the rest of the school year. What's being done uh, at the federal and other levels? Absolutely. Um, I'm a parent of two young boys myself, and we have to share devices. Um, and so I can't even imagine if you are in a household that did not have these devices. Uh, I, we are part of the New York City public school system, which is I believe the largest school system in the country. And we were fortunate enough to have our city Department of Education give out free devices for students to use, but there were still students who were not able to, to get them. Um, and so what we're working on at the federal level, and we've been able to get this into legislation such as the HEROES Act uh, and the Move Forward Act, um, and obviously it was a standalone bill before the coronavirus uh, hit, and to make sure that we were able to establish a grant. Uh, in this case, it was a $2 billion grant to allow people to be able to borrow, just like you would borrow a book from a library, borrow devices and borrow hotspots so that students would be able to do homework and not fall behind. And in the past, if I'm not mistaken, the federal government has set aside money for the digital divide, for bringing more broadband to rural for schools to get cheaper internet access via the E-rate. But in the past, because of the way schools were set up, it was largely limited to the school district's walls. One of the proposals is to make it so that the schools can buy hotspots that then can go out and can buy connectivity. Is that still a proposal? Is that moving forward? Is there bipartisan support? And if not, why not? Definitely. Um, I believe there is bipartisan support. Look, uh, there was 
you know, progress being made. But in light of the coronavirus pandemic, we were and are trying to figure out the fastest and the most efficient ways without having to reinvent the wheel. And that's why we thought establishing this grant program that could, as soon as the law is signed, start tomorrow where a library could issue hotspots and issue devices with connectivity um, abilities and students would be able to get online as soon as possible. I'm also part of uh, Mr. Clyburn, Jim Clyburn uh, from South Carolina leads the Rural Broadband Task Force. And our goal as a task force is to ensure that every American, not just our students, but every American would have uh, access to the internet. And this would do many things, including um, being able to make these types of infrastructure readily available from within the school building to a small town, a rural town, urban area, to even the school buses. And so that is part of the Moving Forward Act that we believe has bipartisan support and is supported by over 50 organizations. It's hard to really think past the pandemic because we're still so much in it. And obviously, there's a lot of issues in education, in healthcare, et cetera, that we need to address for the here and now. I'm curious what lessons you're starting to take away, though, in terms of how we should build a future where we're not exacerbating the digital divide. To me, if I were in your shoes or any uh, elected official, I'd be concerned that the pandemic has actually shown the digital divide is deeper than we even realized before the pandemic. Suddenly now, again, before you couldn't do homework, you know, you had to find a Starbucks, what have you. Now right. you're missing out on education, healthcare. What do we need to do mm -hmm. for the future so that that digital divide doesn't get wider? I mean, you're absolutely right. And, you know, I don't want to say that there's optimism um, in light of this pandemic, but this pandemic has highlighted and sped up and created momentum uh, behind issues like this. You know, I myself had the bill for many, many months. Um, people like Mr. Clyburn and so many others have been working on this issue probably for years, if not decades. And this pandemic highlighted how important it is, not just for students um, who are trying to do their homework, who might be going on field trips virtually, but like you mentioned, telehealth, telemedicine, telehealth issues are obviously being um, utilized and will be even more so. Uh, in the in the future. And so it's it's important to me and so many of us that, yes, we're looking at larger issues of infrastructure, but what can we do now uh, as soon as possible without having to reinvent the wheel to get Americans access to the internet so that they don't fall further behind and that they can stay healthy and get help if they need as soon as possible? Definitely. And it does seem like we bring up telehealth. I mean, I was you know, my sense is with telehealth that actually things have gone somewhat better than one might have expected, especially since mass healthcare systems didn't even have telehealth up and running and managed to get it quickly up and running. I have the opposite sense around education and distance learning. My sense is the problems go beyond just getting every student a device and access, that we're really asking an education system that isn't set up to teach, especially elementary school, but also junior high and high school via the internet. Uh, we're going into a second year of partial or full disruption. What else do we need to do beyond just getting people devices and access? Correct. You are absolutely correct. And this is an issue that I struggle with as a parent of two middle school boys who I don't think is it's in their best interest to be sitting at home behind a device all day long, even if there were no accessibility issues. In New York City itself, we are trying to figure that out. It will likely be a combination of students who choose to go to school for a few days a week or students who choose to be uh, doing remote learning uh, pretty much full time. There are students who have different needs, special needs students, younger students, older students. Um, and for a variety of reasons, parents will likely choose different options. Um, but it's important to have some sort of infrastructure uh, set up in addition to access to the internet. And you're right, that cannot ultimately replace in-person uh, learning, human contact between educators, uh, social service providers, and our students.
And 5G technology holds a fair amount of promise here to extend, you know, we can have virtual reality, we can have all these things. But again, it seems like one thing that we're going to need, and we're going to have to leave it there because we're out of time, but one thing that we're going to need is also new thinking about how education itself is delivered in an era where, you know, hopefully this will be the last pandemic, but we've been told not to count on it. Anyway, thank you so much, Congresswoman Meng, for your thoughts and really appreciate it. Thank you. Our next guest is Mei Kwong, the Executive Director for the Center for Connected Health Policy. Welcome, Mei. Thank you, Ina. So we're having this incredible moment for telehealth brought on by the pandemic. Can you talk about what, how significant it is that we're having all this telehealth happen, given how long a road it's been to get here for telehealth? You're right. It's been an incredibly long road for telehealth. So before COVID, I likened where telehealth was to that sort of unknown actor who suddenly got cast in a Marvel franchise movie. Some people knew about it, but not a lot of people. And it also was not really very familiar to the general public. But now with COVID, with the need for sheltering in place, but people still needing access um, healthcare services, telehealth has definitely become like a major tool in order to provide that to folks. And it wasn't just that people didn't think it was a good idea. There were a bunch of obstacles that prevented it from taking off. And as is often the case in the United States, one of the issues was money. Uh, before COVID, a lot of providers, including the federal government, wouldn't pay for telehealth visits. Is that right? That's true. Or if they would pay for it, they would pay it for a very limited way. So just perhaps certain things, certain services were um, paid for, or maybe only certain types of providers who would pay for, like maybe doctors would be able to get reimbursed for services if they use telehealth, but then you would have like maybe nurses wouldn't or physical therapists. And how's it gone? I mean, we've had this moment where, you know, I know basically if you weren't coming in for emergency services in a lot of places, you were being pushed to telehealth for all kinds of things. Uh, so routine doctor visits, but physical therapy, uh, behavioral therapy, occupational therapy, wellness checks, all that stuff. How's it gone? I think it's probably gone um, as well as be expected when you're in the middle of a pandemic and you have a lot of people both on the uh, healthcare provider end, like scaling up programs when they didn't have one before and people who have never received services via telehealth suddenly receiving them. So we've seen, um, you know, a big rush to utilize telehealth to stand up telehealth programs and policymakers to their credit have recognized the need for that and try to facilitate that as best as possible by removing some of those, you know, barriers, those man-made barriers of like policies of what would get paid and how you could use the technology to provide a service. So we've talked about some of the barriers, but we haven't talked about the most obvious one, which is in order to participate in telehealth, you have to have the right kind of device and you have to have a solid connection. Your agency looks at this sort of issue and how important it is. How big a deal is it? How many people are ready to take part in telehealth versus how many people still need things before they could take part in this, uh, at least on a regular basis? Yeah, that's actually been one of the major bumps that we've encountered during this time. And you're absolutely right. You know, telehealth will not work unless you are able to connect and also that's not only through broadband and having that connection, that connectivity, but also having the right type of equipment at the other end. So right now, when you have people sheltering in place at home, that right equipment is either like a smart um, phone or a laptop, and not everybody has access to that um, or in possession of that. And also you have folks who may not have enough uh, connectivity, enough a powerful enough connection or connectivity for them to be able to like facilitate and have like a telehealth interaction. It's, it's become an issue. So it's an issue um, in rural areas where you're talking about connectivity. And it's also an issue for certain types of population who may not have like, you know, the necessary equipment that, um, that they'll be able to use. Like they may not own a smartphone or a laptop. Your organization talks to all kinds of players in the telehealth ecosystem, everyone from legislators in the White House to health plans, hospitals, and doctors. 
what are some of the things you're hearing? What are the most common questions you get? What are the concerns that you're hearing after, you know, we've gotten this giant field test basically for telehealth? It's to go back to what we were just talking to about the uh, broadband and the equipment, the access to the right types of devices. It's it's that digital divide. So I think probably at this point, a lot of people acknowledge that telehealth is this useful tool to provide healthcare services. And let's also be clear, it's not every single healthcare service. So it's not going to replace like an in-person visit with your doctor, it, but it can do some things which is great, but then you have the concern of, well, but will everybody be able to access it? And that's been a major concern of policymakers of they don't want to make sh- want to make sure that nobody is left behind, that there isn't this digital divide if we go forward with telehealth of like some people being able to access it and others aren't. So it's looking at, you know, what policies need to be in place to ensure that doesn't happen to certain segments of the population. My sense is that obviously it doesn't work at all if you don't have access. But for those that have been able to access it during the pandemic, um, my sense is that it's actually gone better than expected, that a lot of the worst fears of the problems or the fact that you wouldn't be able to do services, it seems like people have found they can do more over telehealth than maybe they thought going into this. Is that what you're hearing as well? I I am. Um, like I said, there were a lot of folks who did not have telehealth a telehealth program to begin with, so they had to pivot very quickly and get something started. And I remember talking to one clinic um, based out of San Diego, where they were saying they did have a telehealth program that on average before COVID they were seeing about maybe a hundred telehealth visits a week, and they it quickly ramped up to a thousand visits a week. And then it kind of petered down a little bit and sort of stabilized at about 600 visits a week. But we're talking about a huge increase. And I did ask, I said, what has been the reaction of both providers at your hospital, but also with the patients who are using this? And he, he said that it's overall been positive, that the providers who maybe were a little bit hesitant to use telehealth realized they could actually do quite a few things as you yourself mentioned in your question. Um, But also like the patients, their reaction to it was for a lot of them, their first exposure to telehealth. And they said, I never knew this was possible. And for them, they're like, this is great. I don't have to travel to the doctor's office to get something taken care of. Yeah. I mean, that's sort of the flip side. We've talked about the hurdles to telehealth, but there's a lot of hurdles to traditional medicine. You have to have, be able to take time off work. You have to be able to get there physically. One sense that I do have is that a lot of what's being done right now over telehealth is of the diagnostic nature, therapeutic in the sense of talking, but not necessarily in the sense of delivering physical service. One of the things we hear about with 5G is that you'll be able to do remote surgery as the most dramatic option, but also other types of remote direct interventions. Maybe you'll see a doctor or nurse practitioner that's local, but get help from a specialist that's remote. Um, is 5G and the coming telehealth revolution going to mean we never go physically to our doctor anymore? No, I still think they're probably, even with 5G, there's still going to be a need to like see your your physician. So really, telehealth is a complement to like what you're doing with your healthcare services and how you receive your health services. The way we like to talk about it at CCHP is that it's just another tool in the toolkit for the provider to use in providing that services. So I don't think like that in-person service will ever go away, at least not for the foreseeable future, but there will definitely be more things you can do with the technology and do it safely and effectively. With the time that we have left and we only have about a minute, what are a couple things that we as a country could do to be better prepared, to better take advantage of telehealth uh, so that we're not caught as flat-footed as we were this time? Well, definitely with the policies, it was very interesting because states have their own policies around telehealth and you kind of saw the ones that were a little bit more advanced where their policies have an easier time during COVID and integrating it. But I also think there needs to be more education for the patients as well, just to let them understand what telehealth is, let them feel more comfortable and let them know what type of questions that they should be asking their providers regarding telehealth. Thank you so much, Mei Kwong. Mei Kwong is the Executive Director of the Center for Connected Health Policy in Sacramento. Thanks so much, Mei. Thank you. Up next, we have a View from the Top segment with our CEO, Jim Vandehei, along with the CEO of Qualcomm, Steve Mollenkopf. 
Uh, thank you very much, Ina. It's now my pleasure uh, to bring you a conversation with Steve Mullenkopf, who is the CEO of Qualcomm. Uh, I, he's one of the most powerful CEOs at one of the most powerful companies that you might not have heard of or you don't know as much about. Steve, I, I love chatting with you because you're so good at talking about Qualcomm, but also about 5G, uh, which you're so instrumental in. Explain Qualcomm to somebody who might not be super familiar with Qualcomm. Sure, happy to do that. So if you if you look at Qualcomm or you kind of look at the cellular industry in general, you, you kind of wonder, hey, how is it that I can make a phone call anywhere in the world or I can make a data call anywhere in the world? Well, the reality is uh, a bunch of companies got together and invented the technology to allow that to happen. They brought that into an international standards body so that it works everywhere in the world. And then in our case, we uh, we also deliver a lot of semiconductors that allows people to build a lot of a lot, a lot of products. So eventually, what you, you kind of see is that there are a, a small number of companies, Qualcomm, one of them, that really um, invent the underlying technologies that allow you to have a digital life or to have cellular. And we've been doing this for thirty years, and uh, obviously with five G and four G, people have really inter interfaces with their daily life. So we we invent the uh, fundamental technologies that allow you to have a cell phone or have five G and uh, it's becoming more and more important for people. And I'm always telling people how profoundly 5G will change almost every aspect of your life. Explain it uh, to people so they can understand. Like, what is 5G and why is it that it's going to change people's lives? It's really two things, I think, from the consumer's perspective. The first one is that it allows you to um, get more capacity, you know, to have more ability to do the things you already do with your cell phone. That's point number one. And, and that's become very, very important now as people are working from home or they're trying to be educated from home or they're trying to deliver health care to people remotely. They find out, hey, I want to have even more ability to deliver more capacity. So you're seeing that today. And that's how it's going to disrupt the existing cell phone user. But what's really interesting is that the connectivity that's going to exist in, in industry. So everybody's industry is being disrupted because of digitization. So when you walk into a, a Walmart or something, they're trying to figure out how they can connect with their products and with their customers and everything's being uh, connected to the internet. The technology that will be used to do that is really 5G. So the, the funder, fundamental infrastructure of business will depend on 5G. And it's just such a profound change. It's almost like when, uh, when steam power went to electricity or we went to the computer for the first time. So Big, big change is coming, and uh, more people understand that now that we've uh, had to live through this work from home time. And we should talk a little bit more about that. The reason people realize it is that connectivity uh, matters when you have a lot of different people like sitting on their phones, sitting on their computers, using technology in a house. You need more capacity, certainly when you start to talk about video, as people are seeing you and I in conversation today without the infrastructure that uh, doesn't take place. Uh, what other areas do you see this helping either uh, playing a role in the coronavirus and sort of our response or even in future pandemics when we do have a better, uh, more unified, connected world? Well, I think I think if you look at telemedicine and I think remote education, uh, if, if one of the things that we've all learned uh, really the hard way is that um, we have to be prepared to educate people wherever they are in an equitable way. It has to, everybody has to have some ability to, uh, to connect with their schools and with education and, and, and what have you. And 5G really brings the underlying technology, the fundamental conditions that allow that to happen. So very, very important for the next time that we have to deal with this, that we're prepared. Point number two would be in telemedicine. So telemedicine, the ability to diagnose people and not bring them into an area where there's a lot of risk of infection like coming into the hospital just to get tested or to, to look at a symptom, uh, really, really important. So when we talk to regulators or we talk to um, policymakers or people look, working on whatever the next stimulus bill is, those elements are very, very important to them. And, uh, and we're happy about that. Actually, we've been inventing these technologies with that in mind. And, um, and now people really understand that in a meaningful way. And when will people see 5G? You're rolling it out in different cities uh, at a certain schedule, but at what point will most people have access to 5G, assuming that they have a phone that works on that capacity? Well, it's really starting to exist now in the United States. Um, so by the second half of this year, I think it's going to be very difficult, uh, particularly at a, at a, to, to buy a phone that really doesn't have access to 5G network. 
Surprisingly, the 5G networks continue to uh, make a lot of progress, even with the work from home. It's sort of ironic, but actually with less people on the streets, uh, people are actually having a lot of progress installing the, uh, the underlying technology. Also, people are permitting and things like that are actually going more smoothly just as a result of being less, you know, less people around. And then worldwide, particularly in China, tremendous activity going on uh, to build up access to 5G. So it's, um, it's something that's made a lot of progress independent of the fact that, um, you know, we've had this whole work from home and, and a big disruption, I think, to a lot of societies. And when we think about the next generation of technologies, whether it's drones or driverless cars or uh, even just like I think the biggest parts are just like what you're talking about in the business chain, the ability to automate almost every single aspect of of production. Do you need 5G for those things to work? Is that is that the sort of the last piece uh, once those technologies so that things can work at at, because I assume it takes a tremendous amount of capacity to make those things run? Yeah, it's capacity and then there are particular features that we have added to 5G to enable it to occur. So, for example, the technology that you need to um, have many, many things all connected to the network at the same time. It's just it's just a different uh, design point for the network, much different than what you would traditionally do for 4G. And so, therefore, we had to put that in there. There's also security and authentication. So the network is more secure. It's more robust and you have the ability to enable new services as a result. I mean, the one that I always talk about, which is, which is a good uh, illustration of what I'm, I'm talking about, is if you put a pacemaker in the cloud and you deliver that signal to, a heart, to the heart patient, um, how good would the network have to be? Well, that's essentially what the design spec is for 5G. And you can imagine if you had that capability, the, the things that people can do with it either to benefit society, benefit their businesses, and just the new businesses that will be um, created, it'll be tremendous. I mean, we we did a study or we commissioned a study, and I think it was in 2035, uh, there will be $13.2 trillion of impact by taking advantage of these 5G features. So it's a really a very, very significant economic impact of these uh, these technologies rolling out. A lot of entrepreneurs watch uh, these programs, a lot of business leaders. Uh, when you were in our office not long ago, you were talking about how you think the next trillion dollar company, uh, the next Amazon or Apple, is going to be somebody who figures out how to put all these different pieces together and build what would be unimaginable right now. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I, th- I think if you looked, kind of, there were, there were certain generations of the internet that people um, took advantage of, either the relationship between web pages with a search engine or the, or the relationship between people, in the case of Facebook, for example. Um, you're now gonna have the ability to have, in real time, the relationship between people, things, the data that they're seeing, and really the intelligence moves closer to where people are, and, and it'll be done securely. And the whole issue will be, you know, there will be a lot of, of new business models created, and I would say trillions of dollars of market cap as people figure out the business models that these things enable. And I think it's very important um, to be at the front end of that, to, to lead that, and to uh, make sure that that happens. Because um, I really, it's it's important part of, uh, it's important time in the history of really technology. The next wave of the internet is coming, and there'll be, a, you know, there'll be some big, you uh, Big companies created as a result. As we wrap, everybody's thinking about the coronavirus, the effect it's had on their life. You mentioned telemedicine uh, earlier. Do you feel that because of the coronavirus, uh, in some ways, like colliding with the reality of the technologies that you're creating, that healthcare will be the space that might we might see the most profound, immediate uh, changes to in a way that would touch everybody's life beyond playing on our phones and having a better experience with video games, right? I, I think there's a, a big opportunity in healthcare to to intercept um, and, and do more care delivery and, and diagnostics before people have to get into places. Very, very important, um, I think. And then education. I think it's just incredible if we had more availability of connectivity across the the, the spectrum for people. It would be just very significant um, in terms of how people can take, can take advantage in, in education. And I hope both of those things happen very quickly. And, uh, and quite frankly, as I said, the the um, policymakers, uh, you know, people that are that are trying to figure out what we can learn and what stimulus we can put into the economy, it's resonating a lot with them. So that's a good thing. Very, very. Uh, it's one of the good things that came out of the coronavirus. 
And you could see, you mentioned this earlier, the next time that there's a pandemic, if you imagine that we had these capabilities, think about our ability to track people. Think about our ability to communicate to people. Think about even the ability of uh, a lot of these kids who are, who are really struggling that might not have the technology or the capacity to have awesome Zoom conversations with their teachers or even a more real virtual uh, experience. Like all of those things could be unleashed if we get these things right. That's right. And and. Uh, it's really not a technology question. The technology is here. So the question is, how do we encourage people to take those bets on the business model? And then what is the right amount of regulation to enable those businesses to exist? Obviously, if you're talking about healthcare, you're talking about education, there is an absolute role for government regulation and policy involved in that, or else those industries won't exist. Yep. And it was, I would say a year ago, people would talk about it as if it's way in the future. Now, when you talk to people, they say, you know, I understand it now, let's get going. And, um, you know, that, that tends to be a positive thing, I think. Uh, Steve Mullenkoff, uh, CEO of Qualcomm, thank you for this conversation. Thank you to Qualcomm for making this broader discussion about 5G uh, possible. And back to you, Ina. Thank you, Jim. And now joining us from Portland, Oregon, is Jonah Edelman, the co-founder and CEO of Stand for Children. Jonah, thanks for being here. My pleasure. Thank you, Ina. So, I mean, to set the scene, your organization and lots of organizations have been talking about the homework gap and the need for all students to have technology for a while. But we're in this very unique moment where it's gone from a homework gap to basically a school gap. Talk about how important this moment is with the pandemic in terms of equal access that doesn't exist yet for technology and students. It's fundamentally important. Last spring, we had several months where millions of students didn't have access to school because they didn't have either connected devices or internet access. It's a fundamental equity issue. And the year ahead uh, really depends on, because it's largely going to be remote or very significantly remote, as we know now, it depends on students having access from home. Um, I mean, this is, this is absolutely as urgent and as important um, an issue um, we faced um, in terms of the stark inequities and the fact that this has to get done so that students, millions of them, um, have access to learning. And how much has the efforts of your organization shifted to sort of really bring attention to this issue in this moment? Again, the homework gap was significant enough where kids were getting learning in school, but if they didn't have access to technology at home, it was tough to do homework assignments, it was tough to keep up. But obviously, as we're talking about now, they're basically risking being left out of the equation. And I know we have kids in the public schools and a couple of the kids literally, it seemed like dropped off the map last year because they didn't have access. Yeah, I mean, it happened, uh, unfortunately, millions of times over. Um, there's been fantastic efforts by the Homework Gap Coalition, the Alliance for Excellent Education, Education Superhighway. Many groups over several years have made substantial progress. Education Superhighway in particular um, has made demonstrable progress in partnership with school districts and policymakers around broadband access uh, at the school site. But now we have uh, an all-hands-on-deck situation in terms of addressing inequity and inequity that has existed and has needed to be addressed, but now there's a level of urgency uh, around it to ensure students have access from home. And the one thing I'd say in addition um, around what you know my organization has been doing in partnership with groups that have been active on this issue for a while is focusing on um, a broader concept of you know one to one or connection, and so we've released a guide called Preventing a Lost School Year, which you know the first recommendation of which is that all students need connected devices, and 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 obviously that's true. In addition, though, it is absolutely imperative in a remote dynamic, which is not ideal. No one says this is a better way uh, to go. That school systems take doable steps to create connectivity, to create relationship between staff and students so they don't fall through the cracks. So one thing we're recommending is that every middle and high school student have an advisor. This is absolutely doable um, for school districts and the Phoenix Union School District, um, high school district uh, did this last spring um, and was very, very effective at it. So we're drawing on examples that have worked and we're recommending that there be an educator or staff person assigned to pay close attention to and check in regularly with every student in middle and high school. Very practical. Um, another practical recommendation is that there be a virtual home visit in the beginning of the school year. Um, you know, it's something that's happened across the country 
in, in, in a sort of literal sense that teachers have done home visits. It hasn't reached scale or universality in K-12 the way it has in Head Start. But now in the remote context, you know, it is absolutely doable that there be a home visit by either an elementary school teacher or that advisor in the beginning of the year to set a tone, to build a connection, to establish a line of communication with families that's going to be integral to, you know, making the best out of this very challenging year. And then finally, we're recommending fair grading practices. And that may be something that, you know, for grading practices, why are those so important? They're fundamentally important. Right. If, um, and so, we're, you know, we're recommending that there be, um, you know, a, we have a guide um, specifically with recommendations that there be A, B, C, and then complete, and that there be, you know, very um, consistent makeup policies and then no zeros. Why are we recommending yeah. that? Because we want to make sure that mid-semester, um, you know, students feel like if they miss some assignments, they have the opportunity to continue to strive as opposed to checking out. We also want to mo motivate students to continue to do their best. Um, so, you know, we have practical recommendations in this Preventing a Law School Year Guide that any district can adopt across the country. We've been getting a tremendous reception and a lot of traction. And what you're talking about is really sort of the shift that I wanted to get to in terms of there's the hard issue of do you have a laptop? Do you have connectivity? Which obviously, if you don't have that, you're not connected. But then there's the other issues that we've seen in the partial year that we had last year, where sometimes students aren't connected, not because they don't have a laptop and connection, but because there's no one at home, their parents are working, there's no one at home to help set it up. Or I also read about students being embarrassed to show their house, to show their living situation, or there's multiple kids in the home, so they may have one laptop and one connection. Um, how many of these ancillary issues are out there and how far have we come in addressing them? What I'd say is they're not ancillary. Um, I mean, I think they're really consequential when you put your finger on it. So every student in a household needs a connected device and enough bandwidth to get access, not one. And there should be a connection between school and home that's very solid to make sure that given that you're not seeing kids every day, the kids are um, sticking with it, they're, they're able to adjust challenges, that if they have needs that, you know, there can be intensive support to help students meet those needs. I mean, these are really common sense um, issues. The issue around opening schools and, you know, what can happen on site is immensely difficult. It's incredibly challenging. Um, and, you know, it really is going to be context dependent. What we're recommending is that school districts in this very challenging year, and we don't want to minimize this, and district leaders have our greatest respect because they're under, you know, incredibly difficult, um, you know, circumstances and educators as well, obviously. But there's things that school districts can do to mitigate the potential damage. And really, it comes back to that access, which we've talked about, and also creating connection and relationship, and then ensuring that the way grading happens, the way assessment happens, you know, encourages students to keep striving in, in term, in, instead of encouraging them to check out and give up. And I know it's super hard to think beyond the pandemic because we still have so much to address as we've sort of just barely scratched the surface on. But as you look forward, how, how are you thinking about how we should think about 5G and some of these emerging technologies so that we don't repeat the inequities that we've seen in the current generation? How important are these new technologies? And what sort of would you encourage people to think about policymakers and others as they're planning for a future beyond this moment that obviously we still have to get through? Well, you know, I would never hold myself out as a technology expert, which you could tell in terms of our setup of this interview. Um, but, um, but what I'd say is, is that it's very clear that access to the internet uh, needs to be treated as a fundamental right and a basic need for multiple reasons, but for certainly educationally. And that the things that we're recommending with regard to an advisor for every middle and high school student, you know, a virtual home visit and then active communication throughout the year, fair grading practices, and then some other recommendations in our Preventing a Law School Year Guide, you know, I'd say if, you know, viewers take a look at this and these are really accessible to the layperson, I don't think anyone would look at these to say these are nice to have or these are things that should only happen during a pandemic. These are ways that schools can become more effective, not through curriculum per se or academic standards or instructional techniques, which are incredibly crucial, um, but through, you know, creating more relationship and connection uh, to students so that there can be 
few, you know, more awareness of when students are struggling, quicker support provided, and motivation um, so that more students are able to succeed and fewer students fall through the cracks. Well, thank you so much, Joan. I'd love to talk more, but uh, we are out of time. Thank you all for joining for another virtual conversation that I hope has made us all smarter, faster. You know, I think the pandemic has really offered a glimpse of the future. What if our education was digital? What if our healthcare was digital? We've actually had to make that a reality. And I think it's shown both what's possible, but also how far we need to go. 5G will obviously bring some new technological capabilities to the mix. But I think as distance learning in particular has shown, technology is only a piece of the issue. We also have to change our institutions to work in a technologically driven, technologically led future. Um, I'd like to thank our partner Qualcomm for making today's event possible. If you like this conversation and want more Axios in your life, a great way is to get login, the newsletter I do, or any one of our newsletters, which you can get at signup.axios.com. We also have two podcasts, our new morning podcast, Axios Today, and our afternoon business and tech podcast, Axios Recap. For Axios, I'm Ina Freed.